When did you first come into contact with the concept of the Idaho Education Network? Yeah, the Idaho Education Network really has its genesis in the 2007 Rural Education Task Force that we uh, established to, to really look at the issues that were facing uh, quality education in rural Idaho and also equal access and opportunity for students in rural Idaho. We pulled together educators from rural Idaho and, and community members and they came up with a number of recommendations and one of those was the in order for students in these rural communities to have equal access and opportunity that we had to close the digital divide, right, the technology gap. That was the beginning of the whole uh, conversation about what role the state should play in assuring that no matter where a child went to school, they had the same educational opportunities. And uh, so that was the first uh, conversation we had about a state role. And then we started looking at different options, whether the state should just send money to districts and let them do it on their own, or whether there should be a state-centric uh, uh, effort, and, uh, which um, was the beginning of the, of the Idaho Education Network. And walk me through your role in what happened next with forming the bill and getting it passed through the legislature. Well, the first thing we did is we started investigating what other states were doing. And uh, a model that caught our attention was Utah. We made numerous visits to Utah to learn about the Utah Education Network. And we were just astounded that even in the most remote parts of Utah, students had access to hundreds of dual credit courses courses offered by other uh, high schools that maybe were hundreds of miles away. They were all connected in, in, together and in, in, in to all the colleges and universities in Utah. And, uh, and so then we began to talk about how you make that happen, how you uh, tap into federal funds through E-rate funding uh, to, to begin that. The Albertsons Foundation was pulled in early to help provide seed money. Uh, the recession hit about the same time, right, or the beginning of it. So, um, so, so my role was really just uh, talking a, 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 about the needs of school districts, the capacity of school districts, uh, to manage it on their own, or did we need a statewide, a state-run system so that small uh, uh, districts didn't have to provide the resources or the technical uh, 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 abilities to keep it up and running. And uh, again, we just kept moving further and further down the path and it became very obvious that a, a statewide network uh, managed at the state level was the way to go. And what did you think it could become? I think we wanted it to become what it, had, what it, what it did become, right? Students not in, in any part of Idaho not only had access to the great teachers in their school, they now had access to every great teacher in the state. Right, you had students in small uh, communities of Idaho that were taking advanced courses that they never had access to before. But you even had some students in rural Idaho that had access to Algebra One, Algebra Two, right, which most students in Idaho have access to. But because where they lived in their small, remote location, uh, we struggled to uh, retain or to attract t uh, teachers to those places. So I, I think the Idaho Education Network. Uh, uh, became everything that we had hoped it would be. It was reliable, it was uh, secure, we managed everything that was on that is on the IEN so that parents don't have to worry about their students having uh, inappropriate uh, access to inappropriate material. All of that filtering and everything was handled at the state level. Districts had little or no um, uh, uh, effort in keeping it up and running. Um, and we saw an explosion in the number of students taking advanced level courses. Uh, so it, it, it became everything we had hoped it would be. Did you have a role in the contracting process and were you comfortable with it when you first saw it? No, I mean, it was all handled by the Department of Admin. Um, and, you know, we knew that the IEN would be in the Department of Admin because it was always expected that it would be more than just an education opportunity, that once you uh, bring that connectivity into a community. Once the trenches are dug and the fiber is, is, is laid, then other uh, uh, parts of the community would have access to it. And it would be uh, uh, um, a labor um, uh, uh, benefit, you know, to expanding labor and business in, in communities. Um, so, you know, it just went through the natural uh, or what appeared to be the natural appropriations process, and then it went through the natural uh, process in the uh, in the Department of Admin where there were numerous people that bid on it there were selections made as is always the case you know one 
uh, one bidder is happy and the others aren't. And, uh, and so, um, yeah, that, it, it seemed to be uh, the, the process we had used before. It's definitely the process we've used since. And uh, so, um, uh, assume that, that everything, all the I's were dotted and T's were crossed. When you started seeing the IEN roll out in classrooms across the state, how did you feel? Oh, exuberant. I mean, we went to St. Mary's and we saw students in small St. Mary's, Idaho, actually being taught by a professor at the University of Missouri. He rolls in a cadaver, he pops open the skull, he pulls out the brain, you know, and I watched the kids in the classroom and they were just mesmerized. He was poking it here and pulling it. I got a little queasy and the governor was teasing me about it, but the kids were mesmerized. And, and I thought there was one interesting thing that this teacher said. He said, you know, I'm amazed I'm talking to this classroom in Idaho because most kids across the country would never have this opportunity. And so I thought, we've done a great thing here. And when we were leaving, I heard one student say to the other, that was a lot better than reading it in a textbook. Right, so, so I, I can give you so many more examples of that. We have students that are living in remote parts of Idaho that are graduating with multiple college credits that, uh, that other st uh, students in Idaho had the ability to do, but they never had the opportunity. So many, many stories about the successes and, and, and really the benefit it, was, it, it is today to students. A side note, one of the things we've been looking into is whether or not distance learning is as effective mm -hmm. as taking a class in person. And so you have kids in Dietrich who can now take AP <coughs> calculus, for mm -hmm, example. Mm -hmm. But whether or not they're retaining the informa information at the same level as students who are taking it in person, mm -hmm. it, doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem like any of that data has been at least collated. Well, what I do know is, is taking um, calculus through distance learning is better than not having any access at all. And that's really what we were dealing with. No access versus at least an opportunity to engage. And there has been studies that have demonstrated that the, the proper uh, use of distance learning is, is, is as effective. That's why you see in our colleges and universities, freshmen in many cases are required to take a distance learning course. So I think it's a good idea for them to have some of those experiences in high school so then we get, when they get to college, they're, they're, uh, they're ready to take advantage of it. Um, you know, blended learning, a combination of distance learning and, and classroom is, is, in my opinion, and this isn't a researched opinion on my part, but in my opinion I think is probably uh, the most effective and, and I think that's probably what we'll see the most of. But you still are going to have some students that their only access is through some form of distance learning and I still believe that that is better than no access uh, to that uh, learning opportunity. Should there be data collected and measured to see if there are any ways to make it more effective and more efficient and see if the students can retain more of that information. Yeah, we, we should and we, we have a, a portal, right, where parents can, and students can actually go in and, and, uh, and, and grade the, the quality of the course, the quality of the instructor, so it does provide some information uh, to, to parents and, and those that are going to use uh, consider using those courses, but we shouldn't limit it to just distance learning courses. What you've described should happen to every class taught in every delivery mode in schools, right? Whether it's the traditional teacher in the classroom, whether it's a distance learning course, a blended learning, whether it's a dual credit, every one of those courses should be held to the same high standard and, and should be measured for uh, how effective they are in helping students learn at high levels. Going back to some of the issues that IEN has had, when did you first hear that something wasn't right? Uh, I think right after the bids were uh, awarded, then, you know, there was some talk of, uh, uh, you know, unhappy um, uh, bidders, and, and then I knew that they had a certain amount of time, a window of opportunity to appeal. And when they didn't, I figured, well, you know, that, that, that happens, right? Somebody's not happy because they didn't get the, the bid, but they've chosen not to appeal the process because, uh, they, well, for whatever reason. Um, and so it was, it was about a year or so later, you know, I don't know the exact timing, about a year or so later that I think there was actually talk that, that, uh, that there may be a lawsuit. And I think even from that point, I thought, well, again, that's, the, that's their right if, if they think that they've been uh, harmed in, in any way. Uh, and then as it started to work through the courts, and the courts, you know, ruled in favor of the state numerous times, 
I remember at one point Syringa was ordered by the court to pay ENA $300,000 because you know the cases, five of the six cases had been dismissed and they thought they were without merit. So I figured this is going to work out in the courts um, and everything it, the courts did was, was in the state's favor uh, until the, you know, the very last <laughs> uh, ruling, which I, caught me off guard and uh, obviously caught many people uh, off guard. How did you feel when you started getting the news that, that there were these issues in the court and, and especially the ruling in November, I think it was? Yeah, I could tell, and I don't think I'm speaking out of turn, I could tell that the attorneys that were representing the state just by uh, their, when they would give us reports at the, uh, at the IPRAC meetings, the things that they were talking about, the detail they were talking about, the looks on their face, that, th that this was maybe uh, a little more serious than they anticipated it would be and definitely uh, more serious than, than I anticipated. So we started talking about, you know, uh, you know uh, the, the, the bottom line is the Idaho Education Network has to stay in place. You know, the, the state started it, the state created it, the state needs to assume all the responsibility. You know, the, you, you don't flip the switch off. You know, you can't push the pause button on, on this. And uh, that the, the consequences to kids were too great and so um, I think we were all in agreement that as this works out through the courts, regardless of what happens in the courts, that, uh, that uh, students and, and schools would see no disruption. To them, our goal was to them, um, things would happen in the court, but it would have no effect at all on them. They, they would see no uh, change. And I think that still is important to, to focus on um, to, to assure that students don't um, suffer because of, uh, of, of what's currently going on at the state level. Do you think this should have ended up in court? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I have complete confidence in our court systems and, you know, in the judges that make these decisions. Um, you know, I, I, <laughs> I've been in court, right, and I've seen how it works, and sometimes, you know, as passionate as you are and how right you may think you are, the courts have the final decision, and then you, you know, you react accordingly. So. I, I believe that Syringa or anybody had the right to take it to court and, and then the process starts and, uh, and once it's in that arena I have complete confidence in our court systems and uh, even when I maybe don't agree or don't understand their rulings. So when you, when you the courts obviously ruled that the contract was void, mm -hmm. there was something wrong with the contract. When you look at the problem with the contract, do you think the issue was born out of malice or incompetence? Neither. What was it? I, I, I just think it was uh, 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 not the proper implementation or, or following the, the process. Our, because I believe, and I, I, I believe what the courts are saying is Idaho has a process that you have to follow, right? It's not necessarily um, unethical to not follow that process, but it is a process and you're required to follow it. It could be a different process in another state that's completely acceptable to the courts because their process is different. And so apparently the, it's the process that was not followed, but I don't think anybody, was, you know, I, I've never um, uh, bought into the idea that there was some kind of malice or, or incompetence. I, I think it was just the, the way it was, the process was followed. I think there was one place where the courts have said uh, it was, uh, it, it was um, uh, not done properly and therefore the contract is, is void. When you look back at IEN, and this is something you're obviously proud of, yeah. when you look back is there anything you personally would have done differently? Uh, I, don't, I really don't think so, right? It, it, you know, um, I'm, not, I'm not trying to skirt responsibility, but the contracting process was, happened by the was done by the Department of Admin. Uh, there's numerous contracts that the, that the department uh, works under that are handled by the Department of Admin. Always had complete confidence in their abilities. They hire the people that are the contracting experts, understand state law, and uh, so uh, I you know, that would be a question to ask the Department of Admin. As far as the Department of, of Ed, we, you know, we relied on them. They've always done good work. We have dozens of contracts that are currently operated within the department that were uh, procured by the uh, Department of Admin, and they've all, they've done great work. This is something, like I said, that you're proud of, mm -hmm. and a lot of people are proud of. Are you mad that this is how it turned out? 
What, what I think will be uh, a mistake is if there's any interruption for one student in any school. And uh, that's just not acceptable. There, uh, and I, there, there has to be a solution short of any school uh, having uh, the switch turned off. It's not acceptable to say it's just a few because that's what the IN was all about. It was making sure that there wasn't just a few that were left out of opportunity. It made sure that, as our Constitution says, that we have a uniform system. That means everybody has the same opportunities. And so, um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, mad or upset now because it hasn't affected children, but if we turn the switch off on even one school, then we've affected children and there has to be a better solution than that. This is an adult problem. This isn't a, stu a student problem. And, uh, and it needs to be dealt with uh, above any, having any effect on children and students in the classroom. Looking at everything that's happened in the last two weeks, is this worst case scenario or can it get worse from here? Well, it's operating today. Everybody's still taking the courses. They're, you know, um, uh, I think s obviously some school districts are scrambling because they're trying to figure out what happens if the switch does uh, go off. But the worst case scenario, it could get a lot worse if anybody uh, chooses to uh, turn the switch off. Uh, I don't, you know, I, I, I struggle with the whole idea that the state has started, you know, the IEN. They've managed it. They haven't expected districts to provide any technical assistance to keep it going. It's been stellar in its operation. And to, to think that you can now just tell districts, here's some money, and now you have to provide this technical assistance. If, 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 we, if, we, uh, if it's operating and, and one minute, it, the next minute it's not, it's your responsibility. To, to, you need the expertise at the local level. We investigated all of that years ago and realized that was not a model that would work all across Idaho. It'll work in some of the larger districts, but uh, so I, I guess that would be my definition right now. It, as long, it, it's working as it always has. If, if it goes dark in even one classroom, I think that's when uh, we've made a big mistake. And what's the path forward? I think the path forward is you keep it, uh, you keep it operational so that students know, uh, unless they read the newspaper or watch your show, they don't even know if something's happening that could threaten the IEN and, and the courses they're taking. Y you keep that operating, uh, whatever it takes the state, in order to, uh, the state to do in order to make that happen. I think it's, it's going to require some of the providers to, you know, to also uh, you know, step in and, 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 and be part of that solution. And then uh, you, know, you get another contract in place. Right, and we have a whole summer when most kids aren't in school. Keep this thing going until summer. Get another contract in place in the summer. It's back going, you know, by whoever the prov provider is. We still have an IEN, and it's operating. The school starts next year. That's the way to keep kids from seeing any impact at all. And I think the, what people need to rem remember is the IEN is really agnostic to who the provider is. It can be any of the people that bid on it uh, back in 2008 or, or anybody that may want to bid on it now. But the IEN is what needs to stay in place regardless of who the provider is. And I think there's a way to do it in, 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 in the best interest of, of students. Are you confident that we're going to find that solution? I hope so. It'll take some leadership. It'll take some leadership in a number of areas. But uh, I, 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 I'm assuming the leadership is there. To, to make sure that, the, the, in the end, the right thing is done. So far, all of the consequences have been for the individual school districts and the IT directors who are scrambling to make these contracts. Yeah. Are there going to be, and should there be, consequences for leaders in the state? Well, I, I think that's going to determine, uh, you know, be determined by whether there were intentional mistakes made. and. I, again, I don't think there were. I think that there was a process that wasn't followed, that I's, all the I's weren't dotted and all the T's weren't crossed. But, uh, you know, at some point, you know, the courts may weigh in on that also. But, um, you know, I, I think, you know, there may be some political consequences, you know, and, and you know, that, that, that can be a consequence also. But, uh, but, I, but I think the, the, I don't think there will be a political consequence uh, if, in the end, uh, Again, I've said over and over, if again, this has no impact on students. Uh, even if courts or um, uh, uh, the judicial system finds that, that there is an individual or individuals that need to be held accountable in some way, still the most important thing is that children aren't affected by how this all plays out. So.
And right now you have a lot of people across the state in these school districts who are scrambling to make these short-term mm -hmm. contracts mm -hmm. and the, the deadline's coming up soon. Are you concerned that some of them might run into the same problems that the state did with making a tiny mistake? Sure. Yeah, you're, you're, you're shifting the responsibility to 115 school districts and about 50 charter schools, right? And uh, some of them have the capacity you know, to, uh, to step in and, and uh, it'll take some effort on their part, but they have the capacity to not only enter into a new agreement, but also provide the technical assistance to keep it going. But there's many that just, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll have at least a dozen that will just go dark. They don't have, you know, they don't have the capacity within the school district to, to, to uh, start it up and they definitely don't have the capacity to maintain it if there's any hiccups at all in the technology. And, um, and so I, I am concerned that, uh, that a solution that would just send money to districts with, with some guidelines and some technical assistance from the outside, I, I don't think that's going to assure that, every, uh, that there's no interruption in, in service for all of our districts and schools. Is there a concern that some of them might run into the same legal troubles? Yeah, I think they could because you're on a fast pace, right? Uh, and so you're going to make quick decisions. Uh, and you could end up in a smaller scale in the very same predicament the state is. Somebody's going to get that service and somebody's not. The person that does not can go and argue that the process wasn't followed and the district is going to say, I had five days. You know, I, I, we, we thought we did it right. We've never done this before. So you're setting up 113 school, 115 school districts and 50 charter schools to be in the exact same predicament the state is. If, they, if we put them in a, in a hurried situation and they have to make decisions, and some of them have no experience at all in making uh, those kinds of procurement decisions. So we've heard from the Idaho Statesman Education Reporter that there is a very strong likelihood that the CUNA school district, which is not a small school district, yeah. will go dark in the next two weeks. So what are your thoughts? It would be a tragedy and uh, CUNA is just one example, but I think that what highlights the highlight for me is that CUNA has been one district that has really taking, taken major steps towards implementing one-to-one -one technology in their middle school. Every, every student, uh, 800 students in their middle school has their own uh, laptop, right? So they're heavily dependent on connectivity in order for students to have access to, uh, to um, digital content, uh, uh, assessments, um, you know, uh, opportunities to learn. Uh, it, that will have a huge impact, but I think it's an example of what will happen in numerous school districts across the state. The fact that a large school district like CUNA would be struggling under this current scenario tells you that the number of districts that will struggle is going to be considerable. How much of an impact did this make on your decision not to run for re-election? Not at all. wasn't even part of the, 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 the factor. Uh, in, in my decision. If, if, I, if I had decided that I wasn't going to run for re-election because of stress and, and because of hard work, uh, I probably wouldn't have ran for re-election four years ago. You know, so not, th this had no bearing at all on my decision. My decision was based on where I thought education was today and the best way for it to continue to move forward. And I'm still comfortable with that decision. Had you already made the decision when the news started coming down that the E-rate dollars weren't coming through? Um, I don't remember when that actually happened, I, but I do think it, it, it happened after I announced I wasn't running. It had really had no bearing at all. I entered the last legislative session thinking I would run for re-election. I had made that clear, but it became obvious to me that the budget I wanted to present, which we ended up getting most, if not all of it done, that there were some people thinking, oh, Tom's just asking for this because he's trying to build himself up for re-election. So I'll just take that off the table. This is, this is one more step in implementing the 20 recommendations. And if, if I separate myself from that and it goes forward and I have, a, you know, better ab ability to, uh, to work with uh, legislators on both sides of the aisle, then so be it. It was, it was it, personally, you know, because I really enjoyed what, was I, what I was doing, that was a difficult decision. But the decision on how to move things forward, um, I, I made a list and that well outweighed the decision to run again. Is there anything else you wanted to add? No, I, I just, again, you know, because I, I, this is what I'm most passionate about is that uh, students in Idaho are, are having access to opportunities they've never had access before. And the IEN is currently working today just like it always has in the past number of years, and it's very successful. 
uh, I, I think uh, unanimously is supported. That needs to be what's maintained as this all works out through the courts and through the legislature. Anything different than that, I think uh, students will suffer. And, and I think that as adults, we've, uh, we've let them down if we let that happen.